but I am Pat Higgins. I'm the managing director of the Eel River Recovery Project and an alumnus of Humboldt State with a bachelor's degree in 1975 in biology. And then I was in the stereo business for a decade and then decided that I wanted to study fish. And I almost got a master's in fish at Humboldt, 85 to 88. But it built uh, the knowledge base that I have to uh, launch a career as a consulting fisheries biologist. But now I've really found my calling as the managing director of the Eel River Recovery Project. And the eel is uh, the apple of my eye. It's the focus of my attention. And I love to um, understand its secrets. So I will share some of those secrets with you. And uh, I wanted, I have done one Zoom for Ollie way back when on the Klamath, uh, but uh, it's been years. And so I wanna thank Jane uh, for inviting me. And I wanna thank Dane for making it easy because uh, I'm not really like a Zoom master. And so it's good for me to have some help. And, but now I'm gonna go with a PowerPoint, then I'll go with the video. Um, because I tend to go long on digressions, I might never finish my PowerPoint if I got, got questions all along. So um, you can chat up the questions and then I'll, um, I'll answer them at the end. And uh, there's Corey, my fish watching friend. All right. So let's see if I can find a PowerPoint. And there's my PowerPoint. It doesn't look like it is on the opening slide, but we can cure that. Here we go. The secret lives of eel river fishes. So this is um, the eel river basin is uh, an amazing wild ecosystem. It's uh, in the top, for, I think it's the fourth largest wholly contained river system in California, and it has been long famous for its fishes. I am Pat Higgins, now the Eel River Recovery Project Managing Director, but also a fisheries biologist and a watershed scientist. And so uh, I've been um, studying eel pretty intensively since about 2010. And I have a career as a consultant uh, in Northwestern California, uh, dating back to uh, 1980, 1988, I guess I'd have to say. So what is the Eel River Recovery Project? It's a different kind of nonprofit group. Uh, most of the other nonprofits that um, work on the eel uh, are advocacy-based, and so they try to make uh, a political difference, and certainly uh, that's a much-needed function. But the Recovery Project is more like engage, enlighten, and empower. We scope the community, ask them what their concerns are, ask them what their potential, what potential they see for projects. And so we work on solutions. And um, also we collect a lot of data, but we, uh, we rarely kind of pin the tail on the donkey. We put the data out there for the government and academia and uh, private citizens to use uh, but we are trying to work with our neighbors to get them to be better actors. And so it's not our job to um, be a cop. So scientific truth, no judgment. Uh, people like scientific truth better without the judgment. Uh, and when we first did scoping in uh, September of 2011, people were concerned that the salmon were going extinct. There wasn't as much data shared at that point about the Chinook salmon and coho salmon runs. Uh, there was a major problem with the river drying up and going, and, and in 2011, it was still kind of a wet period, but people were discerning their creeks were drying up. So we uh, started doing temperature monitoring because it can help uncover whether or not the volume of water is being reduced. Why is the river developing toxic algae that could kill your dog? Nobody was for that. That's another hallmark of Eel River Recovery Project organizing issues. If everybody's for it, then that's one, something we wanna work on. If it's a controversial subject, then we do not usually endeavor. So we frame hypotheses, harmless, right? Is this a guess? Uh, we monitor and then share the information back with the community. So 
Uh, and we hope also to involve the community now. We're doing a lot with grants and restoration, and we want to get them involved in ecological restoration of the eel. Everybody in harmony with nature. The eel, 3,600 square miles, about half of it, nobody knows anything about. The road densities in the eastern part of the basin there, Upper Van Dusen, North Fork, Middle Fork, some of the lowest in the lower 48. You can't get there from here. It is, uh, and the roads are, uh, are both, um, you know, they're, they're rough and they're long and uh, you have to carry a flat, uh, you know, a spare for sure. But the Van Dusen, a gorgeous river system, about 750 square miles, almost comes in at the ocean there at Fortuna. The North Fork, 289 square miles of wild scenic river that no one knows. And it needs more TLC. We're trying to work with the Forest Service on Forest Health because the North Fork was the heart of the August fire, went up like a bomb. Middle Fork has similar problems and opportunities, but that's the east side of the basin. And so it snows over there. And with less snow, there's some ecological stress engendered. Upper Main Eel makes a big U-turn. Since the channels here are delineated as wild and scenic, either existing blue or, or proposed pink, we don't see above uh, the dam system. And there, the eel would be like a big J, and it comes out of the snowy mountain wilderness up there. The South Fork is a fork we're familiar with. Uh, it, uh, it's branch, 10 Mile Creek flows through Laytonville, and then you follow it down uh, to uh, the lower Main Eel, below Dyerville and uh, to the ocean. So how about 50 to 75 feet deep historically? The eel was a chain of amazing pools with depth to 50 to 75. And so you might be able to breaststroke on the surface shallowly, but down deep it was cold. It was cold, it was dark. And so juvenile fish and adult fish could pull into the eel 24-7, 365, and just sit deep and wait it out. Uh, the North Fork. Uh, it's emblematic of, uh, of the wildness of the eel. And there's a great deal of grasslands in the central part of the eel because it's the central belt melange. It's where the geology of the coast range gives way to sheared areas that have a lot of grasslands and oak woodlands. And this is the watershed of the North Fork, which uh, is one of those ecosystems. And this is the North Fork on the ground. You'll see notes here at the bottom because I use these photos for a Zoom series. And I will give you our website for Vimeo because you can watch an Eel River um, Zoom series with uh, Thomas Keeter, who's one of the foremost authorities on the North Fork. But this is at the, uh, the None of the Above Ranch. I love that. And uh, the North Fork actually has slightly depleted flows because of overstocked forest conditions because the fur took over from the oak in its watershed. And that's why it had the problems with the fire. Middle Fork Eel comes out of the Yalabali Wilderness, has one of the last runs of summer steelhead in the state of California. It's a vast and beautiful expanse, but it has major forest health problems. And it has had substantial fires, burned a lot in the August, and also in fires back in 2012 and uh, between 2012 and 2020. But I may not get back to this, so I'll just tell you <clears throat> the fire has switched the flow on in the North Fork and the Middle Fork. And that uh, supports my hypothesis that over vegetation from lack of Indian control burns has caused increased evapotranspiration. And now the fires have caused a flow release. So I told you I was prone to digression. This is the Black Butte. You probably haven't heard of it. It's a major tributary of the Middle Fork of the Eel. It's recovered from the 64 flood, and it's got a 25 mile reach that's optimal for Chinook salmon spawning. <clears throat> the North Fork, the Middle Fork, the Black Butte, they're all in late recovery from the 64 flood and back to optimal spawning conditions for Chinook. The Upper Van Dusen, a beautiful system and, uh, and one that has uh, summer steelhead and winter steelhead. And then the South Fork. The South Fork winds to the Redwood Forest and is one of the most amazing ecosystems. It's currently a little bit impaired by sediment and it's more cumulatively affected, affected in terms of flow depletion uh, than other Eel River tributaries. And I'll get back to that. And then the Upper Eel. The 
The upper main eel between the dams needs to be a salmon park. This is a picture downstream off of Monkey Rock. And this is a wild and scenic river of extraordinary caliber. And it should be a park. pg e doesn't want to manage it. It should be given to the Forest Service. And we need to make it so that uh, this is a recreational mecca. It has a trail. And uh, the salmon habitat between the dams is restored. The main eel below Hearst. Down to Outlet Creek at Highway 162, grasslands right down to the edge of the river. And uh, there's black dots in this picture. There was three bears in this picture. So the upper main eel is extraordinarily wild, very, very lowly densely populated. So the eel has a lot of ecological resilience. So, <clears throat> but what, what hook, what brought me into the eel? The salmon and their amazing life cycle. Born in fresh water, buried in the stream bed, emerging after 30 days as eggs, 30 days as alevin, and then they begin their journey, the Chinook immediately, the coho and steelhead kind of stagger. And then some of them live in the river for years. Some of them go to the estuary immediately, the Chinook and go into the ocean. They grow in pounds, not inches in the ocean. And then they return to the river of their birth unless they don't. So that's the thing about the salmon is they do use scent cues to return to the river of origin. But if there's opportunity that they remember in their mind's eye, even from millions of years ago, they're always trying to go back to the places that they know in the past functioned. So as we fix places, salmon will find them. And their resilience, because each lays thousands of eggs, uh, is really amazing. Here's what it looks like, the magic of life under the gravel. This is the alevin or sack fry. After 30 days, the egg hatches. Then it stays under the gravel like this until it uh, develops pigment, and then it wriggles up as fry. The period of gestation can be quite prolonged if the water temperature drops. The 30 and 60 day figures are like mid -winter, winter temperatures for the coastal area, which would be in the mid 50s. If it's down in the 40s, it could be like, out to 90 days. And if it's like Alaska, it could be 120. And then they wriggle up <clears throat> through the spaces of the gravel. If there's very much mud that settles in the gravel, then it'll wriggle up. So uh, they are buried because otherwise everything would eat the eggs, but there's a risk because the bed can be an unstable place when uh, humans perturb upland systems to cause erosion or changes in flow. And then they die. Beautiful photo by Eric Stockwell. Thank you, Eric. What's, that, what's up with that, though? Well, if you're an 80, you know, 50, 60, even a 20-pound coho or a 50-pound Chinook, by the time you drag that carcass up into the headwaters, you're not going back to the ocean to survive. So the strategy is turn it all over to nature. Let your carcass be part of what fuels the future cycle and generations of salmon. And so um, beautifully ugly. Uh, in a good year, the carcasses uh, are strewn all over the banks, and they're amazing food for bears, for eagles, for ospreys, uh, for everything in the food chain. And even halfway up the side hill, they're finding that the phosphorus in the forest in the Pacific Northwest comes about 50% from salmon carcasses. So, and that's the answer of, uh, does a bear go to the bathroom in the woods? <laughs> and I'll show you a video of this. Uh, the eel is one of the amazing salmon ecosystems of the world, much diminished historically, but this is a 2014 photo that I took from a movie that I made, and I will share that with you, because when the salmon run right about now, we never know what their abundance is going to be like. I thought there was a thousand left, 50 years to live in 2010, and I went into the eel in 2011 through 2014, and there was... 20 to 50,000. I've been as close as a foot to a 30 pound Chinook with its tail waving in my face. Uh, I've been bit by a Chinook salmon. I just love to go underwater and I marvel at the beauty and the wonder of the Chinook. The largest of uh, Pacific salmon species, it can stay in fresh water for only a short time generally, but it goes to the ocean and can stay for two, three, four, or five years. And uh, so those are variable sizes that return, and that helps maintain the fish's 
uh, genetic diversity. And how much do I love Chinook? I love to eat Chinook. <laughs> I'm an Irishman. I Anything with a harvestable surplus that has omega-3s, I'm after it. And this is a Smith River Chinook salmon. Took me many years to get the knack for fishing the, uh, the Smith. And uh, this is a gorgeous uh, animal that I was able to, uh, to take. And I greatly revered and greatly enjoyed uh, eating it. But it wasn't so personal or individual on the early eel. There's indications that there was a million Pacific salmon of the three species, the coho, the steelhead, the chinook. And this is a horse seine. Uh, at the Scotia Bluffs, and this is what caused the original collapse of the eel before we even uh, destroyed the habitat or, or damaged the habitat. And this is, uh, you know, this is the Chinook uh, doing business. And that fish on the far side is a male with the hooked jaw, and that one actually bit me. Because <laughs> when, you're, when you're going up to focus on Chinook salmon, you should never go in sideways always some downstream. But you can see the perfect cobble, the size of the gravels for Chinook is like softballs to hard, or base, so hard balls to softballs are larger. Female turns on her side, digs a nest, kicks out the fines, buries the eggs, creates a depression, water sucked down through the, the red uh, by the Venturi effect. And that's the magic. And the 64 storm buried the main eel but it's now re re recovered in many of its reaches. And I'll touch back on that. Winter steelhead. Uh, these fish get up to about 25 pounds in California, might get up to, um, oh, you know, more on the order of the 40s up in British Columbia, but um, amazing. Uh, they spend one to three years in fresh water. Uh, they go all the way up to the Bering Sea to feed in the ocean. Uh, can come back uh, at ages like two to six. And uh, they are uh, amazingly athletic. Uh, they can jump 15 feet vertical. And I love to fish catch and release for steelhead. And um, it's, uh, they're very tough. The water is cold. And many times I don't get them to the bank. Uh, they, they make me humble, hooking a wild steelhead. A lot of times they just hand you your lunch. They don't want their photo taken. Here's a close-up of the juveniles. And uh, they're speckled and mottled so that they blend with the bottom. Uh, these are young of the year, but they might get up as far as like eight or 10 inches long. When they're up in that eight or 10 inches long, they can be three-year-old steelhead or they can be native trout. And native rainbow trout and steelhead are the same. Uh, the rainbow trout washed to the ocean, develops a taste for sushi, and it can basically uh, adopt an anadromous that is sea run life history. Uh, but if it stays in the creek to eat bugs, it will top out at about eight to 10 inches, maybe up to 12. I've seen them 14 to 16, but uh, they'll only have a few hundred eggs while the sea run fish have thousands. And this is on that cusp of, is this native trout? Or is this steelhead juveniles that are older age, like two years old? This is on the North Fork Eel. It was in 2015 after three years of wicked drought. I expected to see no older age steelhead, and there they were. And so um, if the steelhead get up into reaches that have gone dry or become diminished, they can receive the trout population and the trout washing from the headwaters can be the steelhead. And this is summer steelhead. Now, summer steelhead come up in April and May. They hip historically have ridden snowmelt. They go to the Middle Fork, the Van Dusen, and the North Fork, and they're much diminished uh, because of the problems with snowmelt. Uh, these are fish by, uh, in 1988, when the population was as high as 1,800. Uh, in more recent years, it's only in the low hundreds. And this is a photo by Mike Ward. And this is a photo by me in 2015 at the mouth of Woodman Creek and a pair of gorgeous summer steelhead. But these creatures are highly stressed. Uh, in that year, there was not sufficient flow for them to migrate upstream. And these fish probably met their demise. And uh, summer steelhead are on the bubble. With the lack of snowfall and the stochastic events of lack of rainfall uh, and snow melt, uh, they are not thriving and probably the most endangered fish in the eel. 
And I love to fish for steelhead. Uh, that's a summer steelhead on the right, caught and released uh, on the Klamath River. And the one on the left is a winter steelhead, and that's uh, from the Matoll. And this is one I caught in British Columbia, sneaked it in there just for the heck of it. 26 pound male Kispiox, close to the California record. The guy from Washington couldn't believe I let it go, but I was camping in a Volkswagen and a tent in grizzly bear country. So don't exactly want to be packing 26 pounds of steelhead. And this is a steelhead from the Klamath. And you can see here that it is a rainbow trout. And then the coho. Now the coho <clears throat> is a salmon species. Oh, I, I neglected to say that the steelhead can live after spawning and can uh, spawn repeatedly. Uh, the coho, like the Chinook, uh, dies after spawning, spends two years uh, in the ocean, one year in fresh water, uh, needs cold, uh, dark places, uh, evolved with the, uh, the old growth forest and in beaver ponds in the valleys of the eel. And um, it was thought to be nearing extinction, but I will relate to you that it's experiencing somewhat of a resurgence. Uh, this is a coho spawning in Dutch Charlie Creek, the upper South Fork eel has one of the last refugia, one of the last functional populations for coho uh, in Northwestern California and Southern Oregon. So if we want coho, we better take care of their habitat in those realms because they have disappeared or been greatly diminished in much of Southern Oregon and Northern California. And this is what the juvenile looks like. Uh, this was a coho I saw in uh, 2018 in 10 Mile Creek. And I hadn't seen many others until this year. So more on that. Uh, the cutthroat. People don't generally think of the cutthroat as an eel river fish, but the eel is the southern extent of the range of the coastal cutthroat trout. Very similar to the steelhead, but more intensely spotted uh, on the lower part of the body. And then in the center of, uh, of the, the panel there, you can see the red slash on the throat that indicates that it is uh, a cutthroat. And they have uh, sharp teeth on the roof of their mouth. Uh, they are uh, anadromous, but they only go slightly outside of the watershed. So a big cutthroat trout would be like four or five pounds. And many remain as residents and spawn at a smaller size. In the heyday of the eel, uh, if you got skunked on steelhead fishing down low near the estuary, you'd probably take home a couple of porky cutthroat trout. Uh, these fish have been impacted because of the low gradient streams of lower eel uh, were subject to development. And so that hasn't, uh, that hasn't played out well for them. The sturgeon. I got a sturgeon video uh, if I get a chance. These fish are like up to six or seven feet long. This is the green sturgeon, uh, Metarostris transmontanus, um, could be 70 or 80 years old. The white sturgeon can get up to 15 feet, 1,500 pounds, and can live to be 100 or more. Uh, these things are virtually blind. They wander the coastal lagoons uh, away from their river of birth, but then they spawn in the gravels of the main eel, and they're staging right now to run upstream. The lamprey, face only a mother could love, also known as the eel and uh, for which the, the Eel uh, River was named. Uh, this is a cartilaginous ancient fish uh, with a sucking disc. It, it has an odd life history. It will spawn in the gravel using its tail, but also like you see here, it can suck on a rock and redecorate its red uh, with colored rocks. Uh, they defend their nests after they bury their eggs, but then the eggs come up and they bury themselves in the gravel as larvae or amicetes, and they spend from five to seven years in the mud. And then two to three in the ocean, riding on a whale, riding on a shark, riding on a salmon, but generally not killing their quarry and then returning. And uh, 15, 2015 to 2017, there were at least 100,000 eels in the river. And I got some great video and they were everywhere. And they have this kinky thing where the male is here sucking on the front of the nose of the female. He hits a zot spot uh, that triggers her urge to spawn. Uh, they both dig the red uh, while intertwined. And then uh, he fertilizes and she lays the eggs in the gravel. A great photo by Eric Stockwell. 
kind of spooky looking fish. Uh, my my joke when I draw pictures of them is, uh, we may suck, but we're ancient, and they'll probably outlive us. We've discovered so there these these fish come in in March and uh, January to March, and some of them run right up and spawn, and some of them hang out for a year. Now this summer run lamprey life history or overholding. Our life history, I thought was lost because the river was so degraded and warm. You know what we discovered in the last five years? They burrow in the mud as adults. They just go burrow in a cold sandbar, find the cold groundwater, and then go to sleep and then come back out when sediment transport starts to occur. This is Benbow Dam, July 1967. Two things noticeable. One, flow of the river, not seeing flow like that in, in July now. And this is solid lamprey using their sucking discs to go up over the dam. Lamprey can go vertical up rock walls and get into areas that uh, the steelhead can't get to uh, because of their hydraulic sucking disc. The scopin. <clears throat> the scopin lives between the rocks. And it has the character, if you're familiar with the ocean fishes, looks a lot like a mini lingcod. But the pike minnow that I'll tell you about has hoovered up almost all of the, the sculpin. So when I found this specimen in Bear Creek two years ago, and then I got this lucky photo, uh, this is a rare fish on the eel as a result of ecological perturbations, as a result of the introduction of the Sacramento pike minnow. Uh, Nikon TG6, the close-ups are amazing. And here's another shot of a sculpin. You can see that they really blend in. And then the sucker. Even though it's called the Sacramento sucker, it's native to the eel. But the eel in its heyday was cold. And there were very limited habitats that were very warm. And this fish prefers warm. Uh, so when the 64 flood happened, this fish spread out all over the place. And it was taking over habitats. And anglers were concerned. And actually, in a misguided uh, notion, they began to, um, you know, go after suckers and kill them when it wasn't the suckers' fault that the habitat had changed. They were doing great and the kings of the river until pikemen were introduced in 1979. Now on the South Fork, they're infrequent, but showing signs of recovery in the upper Van Dusen and the main eel. The stickleback. The stickleback is kind of like a seahorse, and I might get to a video. I got some recent really cool video in Sproul Creek of these fish. Uh, they, they're kind of, they use their front fins to, to move around. Uh, they can sit in relatively swift waters, which I found surprising. Uh, they spawn uh, more than once during the summer and uh, can be quite numerous, but they've tended to move into tributaries instead of the main eel. And again, you guessed it, the pike minnow. And then uh, I should have had uh, the suckers. This is native sucker juveniles on the upper Van Dusen above the range of the pike minnow. And I have a video that I'll run from there later. And then there's the roach. The California roach uh, is not native to the eel and yet it is ubiquitous. It tops out at about six inches in length. Uh, these guys have uh, kind of some bright colored markings on them. Uh, they're in spawning condition. These are adult roach. And I can't figure out how they get above waterfalls. So I'm thinking that essentially birds have taken roach upstream and dropped them because their range to me had suggested that they're not native. But in fact, um, it's pretty conclusive that, I mean, that they were native, but in, in fact, they're not and UC Berkeley has uh, confirmed that. But these fish love warm water. They spawn all summer and into the early winter. And so they outnumber steelhead and when the water gets warm, uh, there are a lot of competition for steelhead, but they don't eat them. And then there's the fish that come out of the ponds. This is a green sunfish, belongs in the Mississippi River, shouldn't be in the eel, doesn't last long in the eel, doesn't have the right fins, blasted out by high flows, but uh, in years of drought, uh, these fish, bass, uh, and also uh, catfish can persist for uh, in between years, and then they really set up shop. Every time I see them, I'm just first, I'm kind of, oh, I don't want to see that fish. And then their beauty 
kind of gets to me. Here's one that I found in a cold, dark tributary of Ten Mile Creek called Big Rock. And this is a see-through sunfish. It didn't want to be in the cold and in the dark. Uh, and in the cold and dark, it did not develop any pigment. So you can actually see its rib bones. And so that's, that's like the secret lives of fishes. The catfish, brown bullhead, uh, come out of ponds. Uh, they, are broad, uh, they have a bunch of uh, juveniles when they spawn. And I've got a, a video that I can show you later because it almost looks like a storm cloud when these little fish are sweeping the margins of the stream and hoovering up just about anything uh, that's over there. And then the pike minnow, dun, 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 dun. Tychochelus grandis, introduced from the Sacramento to Pillsbury Lake by a bass fisherman, we think, as a juvenile in 1979. And this fish peaked at a million or more fish in the eel spread throughout the system by 1986. By the mid-1990s drought, um, or the early 1990s drought, this fish was a dominant force. And just, it's still really causing havoc with predation, and we should be doing more to manage it. So we do, we at least count them. So this is uh, me and uh, my uh, volunteer corps, uh, Eric Stockwell, uh, Phil Petrovich, Willie Grover. And then uh, in the back row, that's uh, uh, folks from UC Berkeley that participated in the dive teams and a friend from uh, Mendocino um, who came for the dive one year. And boy, do we see pike minnow. Uh, these things, when conditions are right, um, they're writhing mass of fish life. And so we began to count them. Uh, Brett Harvey of Redwood Sciences Lab suggested that the upper South Fork eel was a major problem area. And so we count pike minnow annually since 2016 in the South Fork eel where Dr. Harvey recommended and uh, we only count fish over four inches in length because under that length, we're looking at roach and causing inflation of uh, the population. And so it was around 1,000 or 1,200 between 2016 and 2019. And then 2019, there was a major swing down with the very substantial spring flows that caused small pike minnow to be flushed to the ocean. Pike minnow have shown up in the water features of the Eureka Golf Course, blown out of the eel in a flood, blown to the north by a southern winter storm, sucked into the bay by the tides, and riding a freshwater lens to the golf course. So, um, but in 2019, it rained in the spring. I thought they're out of business because the pike minnow want to go into tributaries to spawn. Then I saw tons of juvenile pike minnow in the fall of 2019. And I thought, that's okay, they'll get washed away. And then they didn't. So the pike minnow population in our index reach uh, quadrupled. And now it's still at a very high level uh, as a result of chronic sequential drought. And so uh, this is a problem. Uh, we tried to get a permit from Fish and Game to take them out with spears. Uh, now there's, uh, they wouldn't give us one. Uh, now there is a, a consortium of folks that are gonna start to do like trapping. So the eel in its heyday, 50 to 75 feet deep, one of the richest Pacific salmon rivers in the world, and then filled 40 to 60 feet by the 60 foot flood. What did the channel look like? It still looks like. So this is what they call aggradation. This is bed load buildup on the orders of tens of feet of sediment. And, uh, and it takes a long time for this stuff to process. It's kind of like a, a snake eating lunch. It comes down in a big wad, parks in a flat area, rains. But the high flows from 2000 to 2012 in spring flushed a lot of the silt and left very spawnable areas. So uh, this is the lower eel. You can see some fine sediment coming out of that red. But the main eel from Dyerville all the way up to the Snow Mountain Wilderness and the entire Middle Fork Basin are optimal spawning habitat. And a lot of uh, the lower Van Dusen is coming back into shape as is the Jaeger Lawrence complex in, uh, in that basin. So we got into the water back in 2012. I said, hey, I'm gonna go 
spy on Chinook in a wetsuit. Next thing you know, I was like the Pied Piper. It was a phenomenal life experience, and it was a great um, community building exercise and activity. This is folks from the Weah tribe, uh, Humboldt State University dive class, uh, the Bear River tribe, and uh, really, it was uh, it was fun, and it was also informative. On October 11th in 2012, when it used to rain earlier, we saw almost 2,000 Chinook. Later in the season in 2012. We saw more than 5,000 Chinook in a day. I swam over five or 600 fish in the 12th Street pool uh, at the River Lodge. So this is what it was like. And I had come to the eel in 2010, uh, thinking that there was 1,000 fish left and 50 years to live. And instead, uh, the numbers of salmon were astounding. And the uh, spawning activity uh, throughout the basin just blew me away. If you want to see this, uh, I recommend that you go to the Eel River Recovery Project website and stream Signs of Resilience because I was so inspired I made a movie. And this movie contains all my best video footage uh, from 2012 to 2018. But the um, signs of resilience that the salmon were showing are now showing signs of stress. And I'll get, I'll touch on that. So when I went out and I used volunteers from throughout the basin, went to different places, photo and video documented, and then I compared it to where fish spawned from 1955 to 1958, when they actually tagged salmon in the estuary and chased them all over the watershed. What I found is the areas of spawning concentrations were equal to those in 55 to 58 and tended to be in the same locations. So I began to uh, postulate since there was no one putting out um, data on what was the escapement in the eel, and it was thought to be extremely low. And I was finding that it was more in the range of these numbers. And um, so I'll give you the bottom line in a minute, but first I'll say now with a more discerning eye, the places in the eel where the salmon have good gravels, if they can reach them, because there's enough flow during the window of their spawning, which peaks at Thanksgiving, all of these areas are in late recovery and highly productive for producing Chinook salmon juveniles. The Upper Eel, Outlet Creek, and Tomkai Creek are not. They are overburdened with sediment, and the ecosystems appear to have passed a tipping point, and they're not producing Chinook. The lower South Fork below Garberville has a similar oversupply of sediment. Salmon Creek, the salmon don't go into Salmon Creek anymore, but so do all the salmon in Salmon Creek die? No, they go somewhere else. They have been tuned to great subduction earthquakes and floods and fires. And so they follow their ancient memories and they explore for other places to do business when we have so compromised parts of the ecosystem so this is my reading of the tea leaves. Well, you will find um, salmon count results from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife with a dual frequency radar system at McCann and the recent escapements into the main eel above McCann have been only 4,000 fish. Uh, this is highly distressing to me and it begs the question of how many fish are there in the eel overall? And while in 2012, uh, my guess, uh, professional guess, based on data and observations, they went by Alder Point on the main eel and people could count them off the bridge at 100 fish to 150 fish an hour for a day and a half twice. So there was a huge uh, expression of Chinook salmon life. And now, um, they move by in the dozens. And uh, what's happened is that the fall Chinook population of the eel has dropped to near or under 10,000 fish. And that's problematic. And I'll touch on the reasons here in a second. Right there, uh, they took my, back my copy of Java and I used to go to the Hawaii weather server and look at the Northeast, North, yeah, Northeast Pacific and that blue, blue blob off the coast of California is a stationary high. 
And that stationary high is unrelenting. And it has been pretty much uh, since about 2013, with exceptions when we get the change in the jet stream and we get the atmospheric rivers. But it's bumping the weather over to the pole, uh, over the pole to the east coast where they're in the, in the ice box. And it continues to make rainfall uh, problematic uh, in key months uh, like September, October, and November uh, in the Eel River system. And then there's the ocean. I highly recommend uh, that you search on Google for the NOAA California Coastal Current uh, status reports because uh, the California current drives up welling off the West Coast. And we, we had a marine heat wave. Uh, that marine heat wave indicates red up near Alaska there. Uh, we're down at Eureka and in 2019, near shore waters were not cold. 2020 and 2021 conditions near shore improved, but the ocean is on the fritz and it's not predictable. And it's causing, and in 2010, I always thought the ocean was a constant. And so to have uh, the blob come through in 2015 and to stick uh, off our coast, and then I thought it was over, and then it went transited north, and it's stuck in the Gulf of Alaska, and it's caused Chinook salmon populations to crash throughout the Pacific Northwest and Alaska. So then coho, coho and steelhead. If you look at both of uh, these bars, they are the South Fork eel. They are during the period of time that mostly it is Chinook salmon, and or rather um, Chinook are pretty much done. So I take these numbers to be representative of coho and steelhead. And what we see is that there was, you know, the populations of coho and steelhead are no more than two to 3,000 each. And those pale by comparison to historic accounts. And the South Fork eel in 2019, 2020, there was 4,000 fish like the main eel in 2018, 2019. And then there was 2,000 less than 2,500, a substantial drop in 2019 and 2020. And I believe that the differential between those basins is the pike minnow. And I believe that the, uh, the South Fork eel population is more beleaguered than the main eel population. The Van Dusen can have huge runs of fish if they can get in there. So what happened in 2018? Here's a hydrograph from Scotia. So this is 100 years of rainfall data, now 115, something like that. On the left is a logarithmic scale of flow. When it's below 100, the fish are having trouble getting out of tide water. And there's major problems with lower Eel River habitat. And they want to be in Willets on Thanksgiving. They want to be in Covalo. They want to be all over the watershed. And instead, their zip code is still Fortuna, and it's a big problem. So this is a highly selective, this is a selective pressure on Chinook that is really unrelenting. So this is 2018-2019. This is 2019-2020. And so late-run Chinook, there's a few. Uh, and in 2020, uh, 2021, uh, they did get into uh, 10 Mile Creek, for instance, on the, on the South Fork. Uh, but here's another uh, spawning year that's, uh, that really is, is very poor. And when the flow at Scotia gets to 1,000 cubic feet per second, that means they get out of Fortuna, but you really need to see 10 to 20,000 cubic feet per second for the fish to be dispersing throughout the watershed. So then they'll go to spawning in the main stems. So what happened in 2021? The most pleasant surprise we got record rainfall on October 24th. The rainfall events continued uh, through January. And the result was amazing recruitment of juvenile steelhead, or rather, uh, juven excuse me, juvenile Chinook and juvenile coho. So let's see if I can get to the next frame here. And this is, oh, this is spring. So then it was dry September through March. Steelhead could not run. 
the coal were already in the gravel and emerging. And then it looked like they were going to run out of water in the tributaries early. And then we got an April rain. And so this led to tremendous recruitment of coho salmon. And Chinook spawned. Uh, this is up in Cotto Creek outside of Laytonville. Ten Mile Creek should be called the South Branch of the East Fork, uh, the East Branch of the South Fork. And so here's a here's a Chinook that spawned there. And that, this was great news. I mean, these fish hadn't been up in those parts for like three years. And then in the spring, juvenile Chinook were everywhere this year. I'll play you some video of them here in a minute. Uh, and uh, swarms of them were uh, seen migrating downstream on the South Fork by UC Berkeley divers. They were hanging out in the tributaries when they usually almost all go to the estuary all through the summer. Uh, they were around in tributaries uh, they have uh, the spots are larger on the back. They have a dark spot on the adipose fin. They have a strongly forked tail and a wider body. Beautiful animals. And uh, every indication that there was a strong recruitment of juveniles from the eel in the 2022 water year, which is just completed. And so then they go to the ocean immediately. And whether or not uh, they recruited well in the ocean is a good question. But if they did, they'll be back this year as 24 inches or less jack salmon. Then the coho. The coho were, as far as I knew, on the ropes. I find them routinely in fairly good densities in the upper South Fork and the, the, around Branscombe. And instead, I found them in Sproul Creek, New Garberville, not just in Little Sproul, but in the main Sproul. I found them in the tributaries of Ten Mile, which I'd only seen a few since 2018. And they were all over in the upper South Fork. So this has been a banner year for recruitment for coho. They seem to be faring better than Chinook in the ocean. The timing was perfect for their migration and spawning. And the timing was extremely poor for their major competitor, the coho or the, the steelhead. So we're going to have a good brood of coho. So that means three years from now, because they go to the ocean for two years without any variation, uh, there should be another strong run of coho salmon. And if there's enough water, it'll find 10 Mile Creek. So uh, this is what's going on right now. Unfortunately, what we see is that the rainfall has been skinny. Enough water for some Chinook to make it out of tide water in mid-September, but falling to well under uh, historic average uh, into November. And enough water for them to get into the main stem, but not enough to get into the tributaries. So we will see major main stem spawning. It's probably ongoing right now. And I have people calling me and I run a trap line of volunteers still uh, to find out what's going on. But um, before I go to movies, if what I've said has interested you, uh, you could scrap it, scratch it very deep at eelriverrecovery.org, our website. And this includes reports uh, and also video and a wealth of information that's indexed and you could surf it once over lightly for amusement or <clears throat> you could go deep and get a PhD. I want you to watch Harmony in the Eel River Basin. Now is the time to atone and for us to restore the landscape through the use of fire, similar to the Native Americans. And this movie was made in cooperation with Keat, and it is uh, 30 minutes long, stream, can be streamed from our website, and we have to get used to it. We have to um, thin from below, do a lot of what people will consider logging, and reintroduce fire, or we will ride the tiger. And that includes uh, catastrophic fire, as well as problems with flow. The greatest source of depletion of flow in the eel is actually the trees. Vimeo, uh, if I get the videos, you know, you'll be able to uh, see them, but you can also go to our Vimeo channel and watch videos, both the fishy ones that I make that are shorts and also the longer ones like Signs of Resilience, um, Ridge to River, Fish to Fire, made by a Round Valley uh, Indian uh, student who is uh, uh, under uh, with Keat, uh, but also um, Zooms. Uh, so, Lots of stuff like these zooms are all up. Uh, forest health, uh, why we need a lower eel salmon parkway, 
controlling the pike minnow, hydrology and history of changes in flow by David Drawley and Eli Asarian. Amazing talk. Thomas Keeter, fasten your seatbelt, open your mind. Thomas Keeter really uh, knows the North Fork and you'll never learn more from anyone else. And then um, I also have podcasts. So you could go to our, uh, that should actually say SoundCloud channel. Uh, sorry for my uh, late preparation, but, um, and then if you really want to know about salmon and their habitat, I spent a decade putting together a website called the Klamath Resource Information or Chris Webb, and you can go to Chris Webb, and then you can go to the background pages. And what you'll see in the background pages is you can surf it for any water quality, any fish population question, any watershed uh, function. And so uh, these are things where you can continue to learn. And I always feel that if we democratize information and more people become aware that that will be uh, a source for change. So instead of questions though, what I wanna do is now go back to share screen, stop sharing. And I'm gonna go to share again. And now let's do um, a video. So this is Chinook Salmon at Dos Rios, November 14th, 2014, 500, up to 50 pounds. A friend, Kathy Warren, who's on my board of directors, saw them off the bridge. I slipped into the water, which was very frigid, held my breath, traveled in suspended animation, and kind of the fish are sitting there in a torpor. They're waiting to get into the middle fork, so they can't go anywhere. So they're reluctant to move. But once I, you know, once I become disturbed, then the schooling behavior uh, triggers their movement. But this was, you know, kind of a miracle to me. I thought that these fish were almost gone. And then to get into the water and to be there with solid fish, and sometimes these fish will ball together. And I've seen it where the salmon peel off the front and yet there's still salmon faces that um, are there in a solid ball. So this is Dos Rios and Chinook salmon uh, spawning. And then I'm gonna, okay, now I'm gonna share screen again and I've got another video queued. Actually, let's go to this one. I'm gonna go to amazing turny, turtle video. Now, are you seeing the video of Pike Minnow right now? Has everybody no. got the, okay. All right, so then I have to stop share. I have to pause this. I have to go back to it. And now you'll see it. Are you seeing it? No. Yes. Oh, there we go. Yes. Okay, there we go. So I'm in a cave on the Black Butte River. The otters have so pounded the pike minnow into the ground that I haven't seen one over six inches long in two miles. And I go back in a cave and it's solid pike minnow. They're all hiding from the otter. And I'm holding my breath, you know, trying not to move around to make the video so that it's most usable. And now they're panicking for some reason anyway. Western pond turtle. Our only pond turtle, our only native species of turtle, carapace 10 to 12 inches across, 70 years old, probably smarter than me. So now he's starting to swim towards my toes. I move my foot and he freaks out. When you see these, they generally are gonna drop into the water. But when you're underwater, they don't know what to think of you. So this is one of my most uh, treasured videos. And then as I pan towards the outside, you'll see that the pike minnow will start to panic to go out. And then they go, no, we'll be eaten by the otter if we do that. And so then they go back in the cave. Pretty cool stuff, huh? So now let me stop sharing and actually, what I want to do is play you spawning catfish. So stop, share, share. 
Windows Media Player. This is Brown Bullhead in the margins of 10 Mile Creek. And that black mass is tiny brown bullhead larvae. And these are adult catfish that are swimming around and sometimes through the school. And the reason is because something wants to eat their babies. And you might've just seen the catfish make a very quick move and it took a green sunfish and spun and grabbed it by the tail and threw it out away from its babies. Uh, these things are native to the Mississippi. They have no business in the eel, uh, but somehow I'm just fascinated by them. And so that uh, I'm conflicted. I love fish so much that even the bad ones are okay. And so then I'm gonna go back over here and this seems to be working okay. And let's go with, uh, now stop, stop sharing and share and take this one. And so I'm in the upper Van Dusen River. I'm with a school class and I go under the bushes and these are juvenile suckers. The sucker is rare down where the pike minnow live, but they were in a ball here of several thousand juvenile suckers. The reason it's turbid and the gray silt that you see is because I scared a Western pond turtle. And I thought maybe it was the students throwing rocks because I had a whole class out there and they were, they were having a lesson and I was underneath looking at the fish and when I came up and told them I'd seen several thousand suckers, uh, they were dubious, but then I was able to show them a movie. So, okay, and then we share one more time. And this time I'm gonna share something that I just took on October 17th. Now, Sproul Creek, and I gotta go, no, okay, so you're seeing Sproul Creek, and now we're gonna go underwater. Sproul Creek is a major tributary of the eel, South Fork eel at Garberville. It's kind of the northern extent of the current stronghold of Coho, but it has watershed problems. Last year, Sproul Creek at Little Sproul, where we're diving right now, had gone dry. And there was uh, no salmonid fish life. And this year I went under underwater and there was Coho. This is relatively astounding because I measured the temperature in, in Sproul Creek and where these fish were persisting, it had gotten to 76 degrees Fahrenheit, when in fact, these fish actually want to be in water that's colder than 62. So when I got up into the tributary, little Sproul Creek, now we're going underwater in little Sproul, this is coho country. This is 60 degrees. And this is a school of coho salmon. They have scimitar like anal fins and dorsal fins with white lines on them. They have a bigger eye. They like to live in the dark. And so this is a, this is a fish that um, was thought to be almost gone. Uh, now it's favored by the changes in ocean conditions. And um, while Chinook are declining, a coho are resurging. I put in water temperature gauges at Larry, Larry and Darcy Bruckenstein's on Sproul Creek, and here they are, hot water loving coho. This is your climate change coho here, and they're interbedded with the California roach, which likes the temperature better there. But I was just amazed to see coho in fairly decent numbers in main Sproul Creek, and this indicates that coho were pretty much everywhere that they used to be. Now, here's an odd fish. Here's the stickleback. And there's a little pike minnow in the foreground there. I don't like that. But check out the way they swim. Isn't that cool? So these are super ancient fishes. Uh, once one, once uh, presumably much more numerous than, the, uh, than present because they don't live in the main stem as much because of pike minnow predation. And here they were in Sproul Creek. And just to my great delight, uh, there's a native sucker right there, kind of hiding in Sproul. Uh, they're few and far between in the South Fork Eel, another sign of resilience. And so, um, 
EO River Recovery Project. We're a membership organization. Uh, we would love to have you join as members. And uh, I don't think I need to go back to the PowerPoint for the question slide. I'll just take questions on the fly. How am I? Oh my God, I blew, I blew my hour. <laughs> well, that's okay. You're allowed. That's the whole idea. Yeah, you get until but, uh, 1 30. You have plenty of time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, with the so admonition that if you get me start, started, I may tell you everything I know. I'll take that's questions. That's okay. <laughs> so, what is the status of the two Eel River parks that you have proposed? Um, those, so Kafka, the author, he said, <laughs> those, those things that we have not attained are those things that we have not sufficiently desired. My number is 707-223-7200. We need to do something about freshwater habitat in the lower eel. There's a huge amount of inertia, but uh, the fish are stuck in the sunshine. Uh, they're stressed, and every year they're threatened with uh, being stranded. Uh, we have an amazing opportunity to have a trail next to the, the river so people can connect even though we don't fish for them like we used to. So Lower Eel Salmon Parkway, it's just a citizens meeting or two away, uh, form of Friends of Lower Eel River Salmon Parkway uh, through the Trees Foundation. Uh, call Senator McGuire, tell him you wanna go rah, rah, rah for the Great Redwood Trail. And you could be a catalyst to make things happen that would improve quality of life in Fortuna and also give the salmon a better shake. Like it or not, we're in charge of evolution. We cause the main eel to fill in to the tune of 40 to 60 feet. We need to fix the lower eel. But, you know, the revolution will not start on a rant. Uh, if, you, if you share my vision, uh, please uh, call me at 707-223-7200 because everybody there is for it. They just don't know it yet. <laughs> uh, the Upper Eel Salmon Parkway is, um, is a natural <clears throat> and dams in or dams out. The reach between the dams is highly impaired. And what's happening is that the gravel gets shut off from the upper river. They shut down the flows so the channel's disfigured. Uh, thousands of fish jump up there and spawn and they don't find any place to spawn. Uh, so the channel needs to be rebuilt. PG&E has just deeded land uh, to uh, the Potter Valley Indian tribe, and they're holding 8,000 acres of land, and they're going to do something with it. They're, they're not doing what their easement uh, that they are uh, governed by, conservation, restoration, recreation. They should give that land to the Forest Service. We should make a forest health demonstration site. We should fix the channel, and we should establish a, a trail on the south side. There isn't enough recreational areas in Mendocino County. And the Opera Eel River Salmon Parkway, the interest from Potter Valley thinks it's part of a Trojan horse. So, you know, it's like part of the games to like get the dams out. Here's a piece of candy. No, dams in or dams out. Salmon Park makes a, makes a, a really good uh, idea and there's a huge amount of support, but it probably will take another decade uh, and have be part of decommissioning before this is fully considered. But um, I would like to see everyone call their congressman, tell them to fund the Forest Service, have the Mendocino National Forest get new purpose as a recreation forest, and get Mendocino County people and those people and the rest of the eel someplace to play, someplace where they can commune with nature. The grassy plain in Gravelly Valley above Pillsbury Dam has a herd of elk. It's like the American Serengeti. Uh, so, Upper Eel Salmon Parkway, call me 707 223 7200. Let's make it happen. Time is now. Carpe diem. <laughs> You're a great advocate, <laughs> Pat. Only How one body. You... Uh, only uh, one body. That's the problem. Yeah, that's a, that's the problem. Well, we haven't cloned you yet. Just wait. Just stick no, no, around no. for a little while. No, that might be that might be bad, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on how you're socialized, right? So the next question is: How endangered are the lamprey? Oh, I don't believe the lampreys are endangered at all. Uh, they have they have this amazing plasticity to. Um, you know, I found out they could burrow in the mud. I mean, have you tried that? <laughs> no. Uh, you know, so uh, I, I think that uh, the lamprey has been around for probably 400 million years. 
I'm way more worried about humans. Um, and um, although I'm kind of not, you know, it's just like, uh-oh, don't go there. Uh, but the summer steelhead uh, is, is really in peril because it rides snow melt. Uh, the Chinook, it's not raining for them. So, and the ocean's on the fritz. I mean, what I saw in 2012, when it was so much fun to kind of go around and see the salmon parade and people were all excited. Now it's kind of quiet and the weather patterns and the ocean patterns are not favoring our anatomous fish. So they're all uh, trending in the wrong direction, but uh, their demise is not imminent. Well, that's encouraging. <laughs> Define in, in, imminent. <laughs> mine, mine is not. <laughs> How do you know when you're doing these videos that you're not counting the same fish multiple times when they move all over the place? Well, when, uh, when a dive team goes by, uh, each diver has a, a lane and they're responsible for it. And we pair experienced divers with inexperienced divers. And so when fish go under you, the divers confer and then they come up with a number. And then if fish are milling downstream, then we subtract those. Oh, okay. Um, you used the word recruitment several times when I mean, we weren't quite sure what that meant. Yeah, well, when the Chinook salmon got enough water to ride, and then no flows basically washed their juveniles out of the gravel, and then they got to the ocean, and they go into the ocean, then they've recruited to the ocean population. So the year class of Chinook salmon, and the year class of coho salmon uh, could lead to good recruitment in the ocean, but that depends on ocean conditions. And then they would return as adults uh, and we call that the escapement. So recruitment and escapement. So we're having our, I think, third La Nina. And is that what's causing some of the problems? Well, the El Ninos uh, are, are wet here, and La Nina is wet in the Pacific Northwest. And if you have friends in Seattle, they could tell you about it. Yeah. Um, because of that stationary high that I showed, in fact, um, we used to get the rains full of, from La Nina, but the stationary high, so it's almost like we're no longer part of the Pacific Northwest. So yes, La Nina is not extending benefits to the eel, uh, oftentimes, like the other day, uh, we got a couple of inches of rain in Arcata. They got none in Leightonville, Willits, or Covalo. And so uh, the rain tends to be thinner to the south. And uh, La Nina is uh, kind of droughty uh, for the southwest, and it's more droughty for us. But any day, the atmospheric river could switch. And the one thing I wouldn't want to do right now at this stage of life, be a weatherman. <laughs> you know, uh, all, all the models are broken. So the stationary high, which we're kind of in denial on, means that all the storm patterns and all the pressure gradients that we have tracked for the last 50 years, all bets are off. And also the large ocean cycles that cause upwelling, Pacific Decadal Oscillation Cycle is showing, we're now showing periods of like random changes in ocean conditions. So um, it's, it's kind of tough become really unpredictable. Yep. So so to ask you to make projections is probably impossible. <laughs> well, you know, I, I actually, I don't think so. Uh, I'm embracing impermanence. A lot of the things that I've wanted in my life may not come to pass. It's a Buddhist thing. And my joke is if I live to be 80, I think I'll be Buddhist. Uh, but what's, what's happening here is that there are things that are beyond our control. And then there are things that are under our control. And so I think we need to work on everything that's under our control. And the biggest thing we need to work on right now, forest health. And of course, forest health is a great issue to organize around because nobody wants to burn up. But what we're finding is that the increase in evapotranspiration as a result of overstock forests, where we chop down all the trees and then we let too many little ones grow back, Stubblefield, Matol, 2012, Evapotranspiration is causing a 30 to 50% decrease in flow. We need to get out there. We need to take the furs out of the oaks. What about the animals? You know, we may need to eat the acorns at some point, but right now to release the 
option to take out the fur is to uh, increase biodiversity, is to increase stream flow, is to decrease uh, chance of catastrophic fire, uh, and, and it's jobs, it's huge numbers of jobs. So I'm all about that right now. And see, I, I actually have a funny kind of behavioral pattern. When the news of the world becomes too depressing, and I really can't take, take it anymore, I work on the things I can change with a yeah. new sense of purpose and focus. And so uh, people need to conserve water. People need to do forest health. People need to get out and uh, get in touch with the wild. Uh, mind, body, spirit. You need to be in balance. If you're going to make a dip, well, first, if you're just going to sustain it and not go crazy, you need to kind of really get tuned up. And I use transcendental meditation. I use exercise. I believe that everyone needs to be in nature in order to be truly adjusted and happy. And so look to those things and uh, kind of, if you can't perfect the world, perfect yourself, then you kind of, your orbit, take care of your family, take care of yourself. And then if you have it to give, give to someone else, give, be a volunteer. There's four things to happiness. One is you're in control. Two is you're making progress. Three is you're part of, part of a greater group. And four, you're giving to something greater than yourself. So, you know, I think it's all relative. If I had my way, it would rain cats and dogs and the fish would be everywhere. If it doesn't, I still think that, you know, you need to have meaning in your life and you can determine what that meaning is. And in the eel as a whole, every day is a slow news day. There's more people in harmony with nature in the eel than anywhere else in any other sub basin in California, maybe the Yuba. Uh, I might give the Yuba uh, and Salmon River, but there's only 300 people there. But we could get into harmony with nature. We could make organic eel. And don't, don't bother with the laws where, you know, Monsanto will come and spend millions on advertising. Let's just make it our convention. Buy organic, sell organic. Don't have anything to do with commercial ag or industrial ag and pesticides. Revoke the social license of people that are operating outside those bounds, um, not to any, you know, kind of uh, hostility, but just like they're not part of your tribe. And I think that that's where I'm at. It's just like when everybody's on the same page, we can make change. And if we make change, we might just make change at an ecosystem scale in the eel, and that might just be significant enough for us to uh, to have a better shake in climate change and maybe be the place where change starts because. But actually, people should watch the Age of Nature series by PBS. Yeah, because Bu Bhutan is 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 carbon negative. Um, you know, uh, half of Panama is in a national park. Other people are doing stuff about climate change, and so um, you can moan, you can wail, uh, you can gnash teeth, but it won't affect change. Uh, change only comes from what we put in the game. Thanks so much, Pat. Do we have any other questions? Oh, hey, how does it, there's a question here. How does a stationary high stay stationary and not move? <laughs> Why does it get stuck? Well, you know, I don't like to answer to this question, but back in 2013, 2014, when it stuck for two years and I had career winter fish watching, and now I've got a dry suit, so I'm prepared for stationary highs. Um, an academic posited that the period of drought that extended from 8,500 BP to 3,200 BP uh, actually manifest the stationary high and it was stationary for hundreds of years. So the oscillations of the atmosphere appear to have changed from ones where the atmospheric rivers typically come towards shore and come on shore. And uh, I'm not a climatologist, but I do know that that thing is stuck. And I watched it for years on the Hawaii weather server. So why, I don't know, but it's there and it's real and it's problematic. How long has it been there? A couple of years, is that what you said? Yeah, I would say that pretty much since 2013, 2014, the Pacific oh. Decadal Oscillation Cycle used to work like this. 1900 to 1925, wet on land in California, good ocean conditions in the California current, upwelling connected to the Gulf of Alaska, 
fish wall to wall. Then 1925 to 1950, the Dust Bowl, the drought, um, and uh, major problems with ocean upwelling, propensity for El Ninos, 50 to 75, good ocean, wet on land. Problem, we disturbed the landscape, too wet. We're 55 and 65 kind of climate change harbingers? Open question. Global warming has been happening since they started the, the industrial revolution. But um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> the issue is what's, what's caused the um, stationary high to stay stationary. Yeah, yeah. And so essentially, the, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. So then it was supposed to say we got 75 to 2000 was bad ocean and dry on land. And we had the 75, the 76, 77 drought. We had uh, El Nino's in 83 and 97, and we had a prolonged drought in 86 to 94 that kicked off the 500 year drought that's gonna happen in the Colorado basin. And so then it went back to wet early, 1995, stayed wet through 2012, it was supposed to stay, stay wet through 2025. And instead now uh, we have random changes because of the stationary high and the Ocean currents that were linked to the atmosphere currents have broken down. Oh, good, Jane. Thank you. I would have <laughs> hated. I would have hated to end with. But it, listen, that was not good flow. So someone's got another question. I see we've got seven minutes. I didn't ask that question. Somebody else did. Sherman did. <laughs> I'll blame it on Sherman. <laughs> so what? What is the most positive thing that you could say about what's going on? That we're having some good runs periodically, and we have the option that we have chances to save these fish. I would have to say that nature's resilience always surprises me. And so the last thing I expected on September 14th was to go into Apocado Creek, tributary of 10 Mile Creek, which I hadn't heard of a coho in in 10 years and see them everywhere. And so my joke about fish is that they don't read books and they don't care what I think. And they have tricks where they've co-evolved with these systems. And so you can expect to see very, very bright expressions of fish life when everything lines up for them. The problem is in the permutations, the combinations of their, you know, what they've evolved with, uh, there's departures in many of those realms. But the eel ecosystem is 3,600 square miles. On the east side, you're more likely to see Bigfoot than people. The amount of resilience is huge. And if we get forest health going, we'll have water back. We'll have water back. I mean, we won't, you can't reverse drought, but uh, you can make local conditions. This last year, there was just enough water for the coho to survive. So if I get everybody in 10 Mile Creek on the west side to get tanks for storage and to forbear from water use and to embrace forest health, then that's more years where coho or steelhead will survive and thrive uh, in the local environment, you know, just right there. So uh, each of us has the ability, and I'll just leave you with this, because I really believe it's true in the eel, as well as in the world as a whole, and that is, if you're good to nature, nature is going to make you rich. It's going to provide you with extraordinary bounty. And if you're working against nature, nature's going to play tricks on you. The tricks have names. Katrina, the Valdor, the August. These are not accidents. These are action reaction from our collective behavior and the interaction with the climate system and with the ecosystem. So um, I hope every day when I wake up that consciousness is raised. Ernie Merrifield, who you can see in Harmony. Uh, you want hope? Watch Harmony in the Eel River Basin. And then get your friends to watch it so that we can be part of the change that we need. Let's honor the indigenous. Let's embrace their uh, traditional ecological knowledge. And let's see if we can set an example in the eel. And we'll be less likely to burn up. We'll have more water. And the animals will thrive. And that'll bring us great joy. And so you get what you can get. And it's better. I never presume the negative anymore. But uh, 
seems to happen. Judy Berry, I think, was this was her quip. Reality keeps outpacing my cynicism. So remember to keep a sense of humor. Uh, remember, mind, body, spirit. Don't don't get depressed and then abuse yourself. Get out, throw it off. And do something. Don't just stand there. Do something. Get right? loved. Get loved. Go wild. Go wild. Don't go crazy. <laughs> Pat, that's a wonderful philosophy, and I want to thank you so very much for spending your time and putting this together for us, and, and I hope you get lots of response to your website, and maybe a little volunteer help would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Well, and if, if, you, if you email eelrecovery at gmail.com, and you send me a valid mailing address, I'll get you a 2023 calendar. So every day you'll look up at your wall and you'll see beautiful windows and beautiful little miniatures of all the different wildlife. We put together Ann Constantino's photos, uh, people in the watershed contribute, my underwater stuff. So eel recovery, pretty easy, at gmail.com. Give me your name and your address. I'll send you a calendar. No strings attached. You can, you can join, that would be great. Uh, but uh, really, we just want to spread the joy and uh, get uh, get people connected with the eel. Well, and... Thank you ever so much. We really, really appreciate it. And I appreciate everybody coming. And I want to let you know that we uh, have a week off to give thanks for our wonderful environment we do have and all its benefits and all the wonderful people we know and family. And on November 28th, we'll be picking back up again with a, a talk on lifestyle habits for extending health and lifespan, not just for fish, but for us. So All thank right. you so right much now, for coming. Everybody, huh? in, everybody on the Zoom, get up and dance. Do the rain dance. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like that. It's supposed to rain on Saturday. There we go. Let it All rain. Right. All right. Thank you ever so much. We'll see you. See you next week, I presume. Thanks for the opportunity, Jane. But Bye -bye. in two weeks. <laughs> in two and weeks. Thank, Happy Thanksgiving, thank, everybody. And thank you, Dane. Oh, thank you very much. It was a wonderful presentation. I I'll put a, a link up. I'll put a link up on Facebook so folks can get to your Zoom. Oh, very, very cool. And uh, for those who are still here, our brown bag presentation uh, videos they're archived and they usually appear on the website the ollie website after usually wednesday night or thursday morning can you send me a link i sure can yeah there we go have a great day everybody stop recording take care <laughs>